Good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. Welcome to The Rock. Welcome online. Welcome guests in the room. Uh, what an honor to worship with you. I hope you'll be encouraged today. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Sometimes... You go through seasons that are exhausting. I prayed for some people this morning. I don't know who you might be, but I asked that God would bring them through the door or maybe they'd be watching somewhere that are going through a struggle. I'm hoping there's some people here this morning that are going through a battle, that are tired in your soul. And sometimes life can be tiring, can it? The Bible says in the book of Job, a man is born of woman in a few days and full of trouble. I'll tell you what, that's the truth. Uh, it doesn't take long to exist and breathe air in this world and you're full of trouble. Heartache and pain and questions and exhaustion. Where do we go, you know? Somebody here today, you wonder, like, what am I going to do next? Where do I turn? Where do I find hope? Where do I find strength? Is there such a thing? Man, David faced something like this. I'm going to jump into the middle of circumstances of David's life. He's about to find the storm of his life. Where do we go? The Bible says in verse 1, then it happened. You never know when a storm is going to happen. You never know when your life is going to become dust and ashes. But when it happens, it happens and you're in it. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Degev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and all the people who were with him lifted their voice and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David, his two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Whew. Ziklag. Some people here this morning living in Ziklag. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe. What is that place? He comes and he comes back from dealing with the Philistines. It's almost like you leave one battle, and sometimes before you finish that one, you look and you got a new battle over here that's greater than the last. He comes into the town of Ziklag where everybody's wives and children and homes and things were, and as they're riding over the hill and Ziklag is down below, you see the smoke rising from the disaster that used to be the town in which they lived. Nobody's there. Nobody's home. There are no homes. Their wives are gone, their children are gone, and everything is burned with fire, and their possessions have been raided by the Amalekites. It says they began to weep. David's men, battle-hardened, mighty men of war, wept until they had strength to weep no more. I wonder if you've ever been at that place. I've heard people say it, and I've lived it. You have the same emotion, you have the same pain, you have the same outpouring to cry, but you can cry no more. And you sit and you stare and you feel the, the aching, wrenching pain in your soul. They wept until they could weep no more. 
And just when it was awful and just when it was terrible, David turns to those that were loyal to him, those that loved him, those that protected him in the cave a long time ago against King Saul and the betrayal that had happened, those that provided for him and stood guard for him. He looks to them, and will they give him comfort? Will they give him words of encouragement? Absolutely not. The very men who stood side by side to fight for David were picking up stones to stone him because they were embittered and blamed him for the loss of their son and daughters. There's nobody. Ziklag is the place where it feels like there is nobody. Ziklag is the place where you're already down, breathing your last breath, and circumstances come and stomp on your ribs. Ziklag is the place where you've lost your job, you're driving home, you're staring out the window wondering what can happen and how am I going to pay for these bills and just when you think that and feel that weight fall on your soul, something goes wrong with your car. <laughs> right? You, have you been to Ziklag? Where, Ziklag is the place where, where everything is falling down in your family and you're trying everything you can try and nothing works. And, and, and just when you're trying to resolve these problems with your children and do battle against rebellion and do battle against adolescence, you go to seek comfort in your spouse and now you find that you only have a problem with your spouse. Ziklag is when you leave the doctor's office with a fatal diagnosis and come home and find divorce papers on the counter. Burned with fire. Ziklag. Ziklag is the place where your past accomplishments don't matter. You understand the David we're talking about right here? David is a warrior. David is a hero. Was. David had already long ago come down when Goliath of Gath had the Israelite army paralyzed in fear in the valley. And David came to deliver supplies to his brothers. And he hears the mockery of Goliath of Gath. And who is this guy? I will fight him. Nobody would heard of David before that. David comes down and he's brought before King Saul and King Saul's like, what, what, what is this shepherd boy? And David says, I guard my father Jesse's sheep and one time a lion came in and tried to take a lamb and another time a bear and I seized him by his beard and I struck him down and I will fight this giant just the same. Saul says, try this armor on. David said, I don't need this armor. I don't need that. I come in the name of the Lord my God and David does not walk, skip, or crawl to the battlefield. He runs to meet Goliath head on with a sling and a stone slays the giant, takes his own sword and cuts off his head and walks into town in a parade of which he is the hero where people are singing songs. David was a hero, but it doesn't matter now, does it? Old stories don't matter. It doesn't matter what your degree was in. It doesn't matter what education you had. It doesn't matter what kind of hometown hero you were. It doesn't matter what kind of promotions you got at your job. It doesn't matter what your health used to be. It doesn't matter what your family used to be because now we're in Ziklag. It doesn't matter who was loyal to you because now they're picking up stones. And where do you go? Verse 6 says, in the middle of that living nightmare, maybe you're in it, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David does not quit on God. David does not blame God. He does not leave God. He does not find fault with God. He does not curse God's name. David hunkers down in the only place left. Sometimes I think the Lord brings us into a ziklag season of our life to remind us that he is all we need and he is all we have ever needed. He is the only source of our strength. He is the only true power. He is the only true provider. It is from his hand that we call for help. And sometimes we lean on so many things we forget that we needed him as bad as we do. And when we come to Ziklag, there is no one and nothing. And David strengthens himself in the Lord his God to the point where he would later write, some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Some boast in the things of this world, the things they have, their past accomplishments, the crutches upon which they lean, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. David would write, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord. Somebody here this morning, you need to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God because I'm here to tell you sometimes there's nobody left. I think about Joseph in the prison. 
Joseph, a righteous man, godly man. You understand, Ziklag is not punishment. Ziklag is not consequence of sin. Sometimes, uh, the, for those that have set gasoline on their life and burned your own life down with sin, that's a different sermon. Ziklag's not your fault. Sometimes things happen that are not your fault and we're tempted to ask, what did I do? Why do I deserve this? What's wrong in my life that this is happening to me? Sometimes nothing. Sometimes you're just in Ziklag. You just find it. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't light your life on fire. You didn't rebel and deny against God. Sometimes you just live in Ziklag because that's what this broken world is. Joseph, he he didn't deserve it. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't sin against God and he wasn't being chastised or disciplined or anything. Judged? Joseph was a righteous young man. His father, Jacob, loved him. Gave him a present coat of many colors. Joseph, I made this coat for you, son. And he puts it on him, and he loves him, and his brothers are jealous. They're out. They're out in the field. They're out in the wilderness doing their father's bidding. And the brothers hatch a plan. Some of them want to kill Joseph. One of the brothers intervenes. I, I don't think we should kill him, guys. So they push Joseph in a pit and they strip his coat of many colors, a symbol of his father's love for him. And they rip it all up and they put animal blood on the coat. They sell Joseph on a slave train, a slave caravan down to Egypt. Some gypsies are coming by and they say, hey, want a slave? Sure. Here you go. They sell Joseph into slavery, headed to a foreign land of a foreign God. They come back to their father, Jacob, and they crush his soul. Your beloved son, Joseph, this is his coat. This is all we could get. He was torn apart, and he was killed by wild animals, and he is no more. And his father weeps bitterly till he can weep no more. Joseph is gone into Egypt. Nobody knows he's there. His brothers will never tell. Joseph is a slave, he's a foreigner. He's beholden to an owner as a piece of property. Where do you go? It doesn't matter that your father loved you. It doesn't matter that your father was wealthy. It doesn't matter that your family is known. It doesn't matter that you were a good boy. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters now, because now you're in a ziklag of your own kind. And it's just getting started. He works for a man named Potiphar. He's owned by him. Joseph is faithful because he doesn't blame God. He understands that sometimes things are burning down around you, but you trust that God knows more than you know. Many people, they blame God and walk away at the first sign of fire. But Joseph trusts God knows more than I know, and I'm still going to be faithful to him, and I will still call out to him. And Joseph strengthened himself in the Lord. And so he does the bidding of his slave owner, Potiphar, this Egyptian man. And he does so well that Potiphar begins to entrust him and give him more influence and give him more domain over his estate. And he becomes the supreme manager of all of Potiphar's affairs. He manages his house, his affairs, his finances. And one day Potiphar says, I have to leave town on business and I'm leaving you in charge of everything and I'm leaving you in the care of my wife. And that's when Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph with an offer. And Joseph says, I cannot do this thing against the Lord my God. Potiphar's wife grabs Joseph's coat, cloak, whatever, grabs onto his garment. And Joseph, trying to pull Joseph into sin, sometimes Satan will try to pull you into sin, try to urge you to light everything on fire in your life. And Joseph lets it go in her hand and he runs out the door and she screams and she calls for the guards and she tells a lie. This will be the second time lies have been told about Joseph. First time, well, well, your son Joseph was ripped up by wild animals and he's dead. It's a lie, but nobody knows. Now she says, he tried to assault me. He tried to attack me and I barely escaped. And this is his coat. This is his garment. Look, I was able to grab this off of him to prove that he attacked me. Everybody believes her. Nobody believes Joseph. And the only man that ever trusted him is most angry, Potiphar. And he is thrown into the prison. 
Ziklag is when you're a slave in Egypt and you get falsely accused of assault and thrown in prison. And you know what the Bible says? The Lord was with Joseph in the prison. The Lord was with Joseph in the prison. Sometimes in Ziklag, God is just getting started doing what he's doing in your life. Sometimes that's exactly where he needs you to do what he's going to do. Daniel in the lion's den. He was faithful to his God. He too, like Joseph before him, was an exile from a foreign land, a slave of sorts in Babylon, a foreign country of foreign gods and evil kings. And he was faithful to his God. He was faithful in his responsibility. And he climbed in the ranks and he was given great responsibility under King Darius. And so much so that he had the jealousy of the other government officials. And they hatched a plan to uh, play to the king's ego that for 30 days no one could pray to any God except you, O king. And it was not to be unsealed by the law of the Medes and the Persians. And they, the king signed it. Daniel was not around to stop it. The king signed it into law. And the Bible says when Daniel knew that the injunction had been signed, he went back to his house and he opened the windows. He was unashamed. He was not going to hide. He was not going to fake it. He opened his windows like he did before and he prayed three times a day as was his custom. They were ready. They had set the trap in regard to his God and they come in and they arrest Daniel. They bring him before the king and they remind the king the law cannot be undone according to the seal of the Medes and the Persians and Daniel must die by mouth of lions. Ziklag. Like you're trying to do right. You're trying to be faithful. You're trying to be righteous. You're trying to be honorable. And it seems that something only piles on top of it and runs you into the lion's den. And the Bible says they open it up and they throw Daniel down. We would later learn that these were starving lions looking to tear someone apart. And they throw Daniel down there and they seal it over top and the king does not eat and the king does not sleep all night. He is in agony in his bed and at the break of dawn, King Darius comes running and he calls, open the den. And they open the den and he calls down in desperation, Daniel, are you in there? And through a divine miracle, he hears back, O king, live forever. And the first words out of Daniel's mouth, my God has shut the lie. He sent his angel and he shut the lion's mouth. Who was in there? Nobody. Who was in the prison with Joseph? Nobody that mattered. There was nobody to help, no one that loved him, and the only one in there lied to him. Joseph said, when you get out of here, when you go back to the Pharaoh, you tell him I'm here, and you tell him what happened, and you tell him the true story and what God has done in me. He said, okay, 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 and he doesn't do it. Daniel is thrown down in the lion's den. There's nobody there except a lion pacing back and forth, staring Daniel down. Where did he go? Not the Christian bookstore. <laughs> There's no book for that. Where did he go? There's no podcast to download in Ziklag. You understand? There's nowhere to go. Where did he go? There's no antidepressants on the shelf at this point, and that's pretty depressing. Like anybody's going to have a condition in that moment. And there's nowhere to reach. There's no friend to call. There are no friends left and there's no pastor to meet with. You're all alone. Sometimes there are circumstances where everything has been burned so far to the ground that there's nowhere to go. There's no clever anecdote for it. There's no motivational speaker for it. You've got nowhere to go except one place. The Lord was with Joseph in the prison, and Daniel said, God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Jonah, fainting away in the fish, remembered the Lord. So that's what Ziklag does. You remember who God is because you have no choice. Somebody this morning needs to remember the Lord. Needs to remember the Lord, that the Lord is with you in the prison. He is with you in the den. And when everybody is gone and all the promises were false and people that said they would be there aren't, God stands next to you. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. What do we need to remember? Oh man, somebody in Ziklag, be strengthened this morning in the Lord. Be strengthened in the Lord your God. Do you know the Lord? The Bible says he is our refuge and our strength and our ever-present help in time of trouble. Maybe you're in a time of trouble. 
Jonah remembered the Lord. Maybe you need to remember the Lord. What do you need to remember? Romans 8.35 says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate us? Will tribulation? Maybe you're in tribulation. David was in great tribulation when he came into Ziklag. It's full of tribulation. Or distress. David was greatly distressed. Maybe you're distressed. Will that separate you from the love of Christ? Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? Will any of that separate you from the love of Christ? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Sometimes our life feels like that. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. He said, for I am convinced that neither death nor life. Some people, some people on their deathbed, you know, talking to somebody right now, you were just diagnosed and you're staring death in the face because of what they told you. Somebody on a hospital bed somewhere, they're looking death in the eye. Will that be able to separate you from the love of Christ? Is that what finishes you off in your soul? Absolutely not. It says, for death, neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, spiritual darkness attacking your mind, attacking your heart, attacking your family, things present, whatever's going on now, things to come, what you're worried about tomorrow, powers, height, depth, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our our Lord. You need to remember that God loves you. The Bible says through the prophet Jeremiah, I have loved them with an everlasting love. Now maybe your dad didn't do that. Maybe you had a terrible father in this world and he said he would love you, but he didn't. Maybe your mom didn't do that. She said, I love you. But their actions spoke far different. Maybe your husband stood at the altar of marriage and pledged things to love you till death do us part, but it was only a few years until you parted. Things in this world separate us from the love of each other. There, there were things in David's men and in their hearts and the circumstances of Ziklag. They said they'd be with David forever. They were in the cave and they said they would give their very lives for him until the right circumstances came and they picked up stones to stone him. Maybe your wife said she would love you, but she didn't. Your friends, they promised things, and they said they would be there no matter what, and I will never leave you, and I got your back until the right things happened, and then they were gone, never to be seen again. The Bible comes along amidst all the lies of man, all the disappointment of people in this world where their love was conditional, their love was broken, and their promises were, uh, they were empty in the end. And God says nothing. I don't know about all that, but I will never, book of Hebrews, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and no matter what comes, death, hell, high water, I will not stop loving you. I will never leave you. Height, depth, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It is why he declared to the believer, sometimes we are told by the enemy and we are told by people that Satan is using in our life that the sins of our past have separated us from the love of Christ or the sins of yesterday. And you may know the Lord and, and you may believe for salvation, but you made some mistakes and you fell into some trouble and you got some problems and, and now you start to wonder, has God left me? Does God no longer love me because I did this thing and I have this thing and this, this list of problems that are, are going on in my life lately and maybe God doesn't love me anymore? You need to be reminded. You need to remember like Jonah while he was fainting away who your God is because your God has said when he took your sin to the cross, he declared it finished at the cross. It is finished. Satan tries to unfinish it all the time. Our sins, our mistakes, our past, our former captivity. It says he came to set the captive free. And he nailed our sin. What's the Colossians 2 says? It says the, the, the decree against us. He has taken out of the way and nailed it to the cross. And Satan and people and people that we thought loved us often try to take it off the cross and nail it back to your soul. And then we question, is this... In Ziklag, we, we, we question, it's like we can't see clearly through the smoke of the battle that surrounds us, and we have all these voices, this is because of your past, and God doesn't really love you, and you're not really saved, and you stand condemned, and you deserve it to be so, and we need to hear the words of Jesus speak to our heart and defeat the lies of the enemy when he said, it is finished. God loves you. Sometimes we forget that in Ziklag. 
God loved David. What a mess. But God loved him. What a mess, Joseph's life. What a colossal mess this was. And you know why the Lord was with him in the prison? Because he loved him. You know why he shut that lion's mouth down in that dark lion's den in a foreign land? Because he loved him. I don't know why Ziklag happens sometimes. I really don't. But I know God is there. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I wonder what David remembered when he strengthened himself in the storm. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. Got some babies up in here. It's okay. You're not going to hear a guy with five kids complain about fussing babies. That would be the pinnacle of hypocrisy for me. It's all right. If babies aren't born, the whole church is going to get old and die, and it'll be boring and awful. So we've got to have some babies, have some kids, right? We've got to have some, some fresh blood in here challenging us. <clears throat> Long time ago, before David got to Ziklag, he was just a shepherd boy. What did he do? He strengthened himself in the Lord in Ziklag. He was a shepherd boy. Nobody knew him. Family wasn't known. His father wasn't some powerful man necessarily, anything like that, and nobody knew him. God spoke through the prophet Samuel that Saul had forsaken his calling as the king, and God was going to replace him as the king, and it was going to come out of Jesse's house. So he sent the prophet Samuel to Jesse's house. Listen to this. Sends him to his house, and he says, uh, need to take a look at the boys, please. Need to take a look at your sons. A lot of handsome sons that Jesse had. Starts marching the boys out in handsome, strapping order. Brings one out. He's like, what about this one? Samuel the prophet. He's like, no, no, no. Nice kid. Nope. Brings another one out. Handsome, capable, smart, strong, leader. Nope. And he brings another one out. He brings like six or seven boys out. He's like marching them out, marching them out, whatever. He brings a bunch of kids out, big, big guys. And he's like, nope, 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 nope. What's it say in Zik? Like David strengthened himself in the Lord. Did God take his mind back to this moment? And David, David at this point in, isn't even important enough to invite to the party. Look what the Bible says. Samuel's there and he's like, wait a second. He's, he's like, is this it? Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he, Jesse, said, There remains yet the youngest. And behold, he is tending the sheep. I love this. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. You go get that boy. And nobody's sitting down until he comes in this room. He wasn't even important enough to invite is, is this, are these all the boys? It's, it's weird. God told me to come here, and he said, it's going to be one of your sons, it's going to be anointed king, and I've seen them all, and God has not spoken. Is there anybody else? He's, well, I mean, I guess. <laughs> there is one. There's the youngest. He describes him. He describes him by what he thinks disqualifies him. You understand that? It, there is the youngest. Why did he need to say that? Still a son. Well, there's the youngest. Like, what is? It? Fill it in, Jesse. Obviously, it's not going to be him. He's tending the sheep. He describes him by the duty that is so low. He, the youngest, tending the sheep. We're talking about a king here. We're not talking about a shepherd boy. That's the youngest kid in the house. How's it not these guys? You ever feel like that? Satan makes you feel like that. That you're not even important enough to invite to the party. Then you hear the voices of the enemy. But God is calling, God has spoken to your heart just the same. And he's called to your soul. And he saved you for a purpose and he gifted you for a function in the body of Christ to bring him glory. But the enemy has people paralyzed in their seats, not functioning in the body because he's trying to show you all the other sons of Jesse and go, well, if they're not doing it, how do you think you're going to do it? 
If, 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 if them, who is greatly more qualified than you are, how do you think you're ever going to do it? Because they're not even doing it. Yet you feel God mysteriously calling. I think the Lord is speaking. I think the Lord is calling. Well, if they don't have the past that you have, why would you think you would be called to do that with the past that you've got? And all of these disqualified, you're just the youngest tending your father's sheep. You're not the king, man. Samuel the prophet says, go get the kid. Did one of the boys try to sit down and wait? Whoa, 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 son. Stand back up. Ain't nobody sitting down until that other kid walks in here. I always imagine Jesse shined up all his other boys knowing that Samuel was coming. Like, guys, no, this is, we're talking king talk here. Like, you know, let's get some clothes, clean it, comb the hair. Let's clean it up. Like, we're talking, one of you is a king. Walk like a king, dress like a king, act like a king. David, he said, somebody go get the kid. Hurry up about it. So David comes in from the sheep pasture. What did he smell like? <laughs> Look what the Bible says. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, you know, kind of sun-baked, red-faced, you know, dark, tanned, Middle Eastern boy, coming all dirty. You know, he's got his sheep gear on, got his sandals on. What was he stepping in? You know, he's wrestling. Sheep herding isn't like you see in a movie where you're like, come sheep to me. And, you know, like my, my neighbor tends sheep. And I watch my neighbor throw down with sheep. Like he, I watched him put him in a headlock and throw, and get in there. And he's kneeing him and he's got one leg up. I, I'm not kidding. Anyone, I, I'm telling you, like sheep herding and he's pushing and pulling and they're like pushing back and bumping heads. And he's a filthy mess. His feet are just splatting and everything. I've watched it happen. I got to back up. I'm like, wow, this is a mess. That's how David came in. David comes in. Somebody call me? There's no one watching the sheep. What's, 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 who, are, who are you? Who are these people? He was ruddy. He was young. He was a shepherd boy. He was unqualified. He was uneducated. Listen to this part. He was unimportant to man with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. That's the one. That dirty kid right there, that young boy, the one that wasn't important enough by man to invite, pour the oil on his head. This boy is the king. Amen. Praise the Lord. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. All the important people stood around. All right. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. What does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Consider your calling, brethren. Consider your calling, brethren. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise, not many strong. It says God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. That's all of us sitting here right now. Like we look around. He tries to draw our attention to the mighty, to the wise, to the noble, to the important, to the rich. All of these things. And the Lord is calling. He says, consider your calling. He doesn't say, for the few of you that are called and the rest of you sit and watch. He says, consider your calling, brethren. You know him if you've been saved by him, if he is your redeemer, if he is your savior. He has called you for a reason. He has saved you for a reason and called you for a purpose to bring him glory and to function and fulfill part of the great commission because he is our king. You have a calling. Did David, when he strengthened himself in the Lord his God, after all of that, after the oil was poured on his head, years later in a mess, what did he think when he stood up from that anointing ceremony? What did he think when he walked? Okay, I got sheep to take care of. He's got oil on his head. Did he walk back out in, in space like, what? Like the, the king? Like when he sat down in the hot sun, Watching those sheep later that day, what was he thinking about? Was he scared to death? Like, was that real? Was he excited? Did he pray? Did he cry? I would have thrown up.
Years passed. And now he's in Ziklag. He's still not the king. And everybody hates him. And everything is burned with fire. And everybody's gone. Strengthened himself. You know what somebody needs to remember here today? Some of us, you were saved. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't, I don't know what. You were saved in Jesus. And somewhere along the line, God spoke to your heart powerfully. You had a moment. There's only a handful sometimes of those moments in our lives. Those trajectory changing moments. That changed David's life. He was a shepherd boy, going to manage and be a part of the farm, going to run the farm. Until that day he met Samuel and he knelt down and that oil came over his head and he said, this is he. His trajectory changed forever. There aren't a ton of those moments in our lives, but some believers here this morning, maybe it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, you had a moment with God and you felt in your soul the Lord speak, this is your purpose. This is what I saved you for. I remember that. I think about it sometimes. I have to remember it sometimes because we get in sick lag. We forget who we are and what we were called for. I remember that old man preaching. Maybe I was 20 years old or something. I remember sitting there. And he said, he said, maybe I'm talking to some young man. And I felt like, like I just thought there were 5,000 people in that room. And I, I knew, I knew. I'm, I'm not the guy that wants to think that God's always talking to me. Like, I thought, what? Like, he said, maybe I'm talking to some young man here. I want to tell you something right now. Maybe God is talking to some young man here right now. Right in here today. I remember that old guy, voice above a whisper. And he said, God is calling you. God is speaking to you. And you know his voice. And I thought, I, I, I started losing it. I just thought, I've never, I've never, there's only a handful of those times. I don't have 50 of those stories. I have that one. And I, it was so clear. It wasn't my salvation. That was my purpose that Jesus saved me for. It was so crystal clear. I thought, I said with the prophet Isaiah in my soul, here am I, Lord, send me. I, I, I hear you. It, it was a razor sharp calling. It was a laser focused purpose. And I thought, and I said to God, I say still, I will go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say if you provide it. If you, I was scared to death. I wanted to vomit. And I thought, I know that this is my thing. This is my thing, and I will do it, and I will do it forever. It was like God sat down at the table of my life and wiped it clean. Every plan, every ambition, every business idea, every childhood dream, just shoved it all on the floor of the table and sat down. He said, come and follow me, and you do this. And I thought, when I walked away, that old man, he prayed for us, that in the morning... I'd be preaching Jesus to people. I thought that. What did David think? When was it going to happen? It still has. He's in Ziklag. It still hasn't happened. He works for Saul and he wants to kill him. Like he's throwing spears across the palace. Like this is how it was going to go? This is what I was anointed for sometimes. Sometimes God calls you, but it isn't the moment. Sometimes God calls you, but it isn't the season. But he plants that seed in your heart and you can't shake it. I couldn't shake it. I worked jobs. I got married. I had kids. I, I, I couldn't shake it. And I knew, I knew I would just go back to that and back to that. I thought, man, I know God called me to do something. And, and then God opens doors at the right time. And Ziklag, what David doesn't realize is Ziklag was the door. In the next chapter, Saul will fall dead on the battlefield and David will arrive. The crown will fall on his head and it will go all the way back to that anointed moment. In Ziklag, when we question the most, sometimes that is the door through which God calls us to say, now is the time. 
Now is the moment. It was so clear, but sometimes it gets so foggy in the fight. Listen, I don't say this to, 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 to be annoying or to be, I'm not in a mood, I'm not mad. I just, I'm just trying to maybe encourage somebody's heart. Sometimes I have to remember the calling. I have to remember, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did God call me for? Because what I didn't see when I got prayed for by that old man and when the Lord spoke to my heart and I said, here are my Lord, send me. I didn't see all the emails that would come. Okay, you can email me, it's okay. I just, but I didn't see all the emails. Hating, just hating. I'm, I'm not sad, I'm not fussing, I don't need you to come up and hugs and kisses. It's okay, Pastor West, we love you even if people don't. I, I don't need that, I'm not, I just didn't see it. I didn't see the perpetual criticisms like woodpeckers in my soul. Like just, just, I didn't see the life-sucking meetings about nothing where I feared at times, I hope Jesus doesn't come back right now and find me doing this. I want him to come back now and find me doing this. Like this is what I want. Like, this is what he called me for. Like see, I told you I would do what you said. Like, like I, I, this is what I want. I, I don't want to, to, to be debating Silliness. I, I, I don't want to, I, you know, some people, the Bible says there's a gift of administrations and praise God for people that are here and serve in that capacity and help. But there are times I get pulled into administrative duties and the management and project. Listen, I'm excited about what's going on in the church. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about the impact of the gospel down the road. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm okay saying it, God didn't call me on that day to build a building. Like, that's not what he saved me for. And, and, I, and it's a tool. It's a tool as much as a van or a bus or a computer. And I'm fine with that. But that's not my purpose. And that's not what I'm giving my energy to. I'm not out there. I'm not going to put a hard hat on and, and be a project manager. Like, and, I, and I, I have felt that pull. And I have felt that. And go to this and go to that and do this and listen to this. And let me suck the life out of you for this. And I think, man, oh. And, 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 and sometimes I have to come back and on a Sunday morning right now during the worship in tears, encouraged. And sometimes I have to get down and strengthen myself in the Lord and go, wait a second. What did he call me for? I'll tell you what he called me for. He called me for this. He called me for here. He called me to proclaim him and bring him glory. And all of the other peripheral stuff can burn down if we proclaim Jesus as the king. Remember what he saved you for. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. He loves you in the storm. He called you for a purpose. And sometimes the only thing that carries me through is I have to say out loud to myself, Jesus is coming. Like no matter what I'm doing, I come into Ziklag and I'm like, well... Jesus is coming soon, and he said, let not your heart be troubled. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until he does, I have to remind myself that though, uh, that though these temporal things and though our flesh decays, the Bible says we are, we, we are looking not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. And sometimes we're all caught in the temporal, caught in the visible, and I have to look to the eternal and go, oh yeah! Oh yeah! Did David, when he strengthened himself in the Lord, remember that moment as a shepherd boy with the oil dripping off his head and in Ziklag go, that's right! That's right! Though this, still this. Would you bow for prayer this morning? Maybe you're discouraged. Man, I hope God sent somebody here discouraged. And I hope the word of God, I hope the spirit of the living God, not a pastor, not a song, I hope the power of God strengthens your soul. What is it? Are you in a storm? Do you know Ziklag well? Let the Lord have you in it. That might be the door to what God has spoken to your heart. Let his truth and his word warm your cold, tired soul. Call out to him right now. Lord, I'm in Ziklag. I don't know what to do. I don't know where it ends. Asking for hope. Asking for encouragement. Joseph in the prison. The Lord was with Joseph and the Lord is with you. Maybe you're in the prison and everybody's gone. The lions are stalking. 
The den is dark. Do not look at the things which are seen. Close your eyes, surrender your heart, and set it on the things which are not seen. Because though your heart is troubled, Jesus said, don't let it be troubled. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming. I'm coming. Take a minute and strengthen yourself in the Lord this morning.